uh, Daryl Mails, he's also been with uh, agri in agriculture in Western Canada for many, many years. Uh, he's with Agrisoma and Mustard 21, which he will elaborate on a little bit more. Um, and so with that, if you could join me in welcoming Mr. Daryl Mails. Nice to have everybody here today and thanks to Farming Smarter for the uh, invitation and also for their collaboration as a research partner for this new crop. Launching a new crop uh, is both exciting and demanding uh, and if nothing else it's one huge learning experience. This past year, which was our small launch year, uh, has just flown by and the learnings never stop and so this presentation that was written a week ago is now a little out of date, so you'll see me stop at a couple spots and put in some new information that just arrived the last 48 hours. And uh, before I move on too, I'd just like to mention that I mean Agriculture Canada and Mustard 21 that Matt just mentioned have been critical to the launch of this new crop, Ag Canada and Dr. Kevin Falk for all the work that's gone into breeding the crop and taking it to a point where it's ready for a, a launch and uh, the growers under uh, SMDC and uh, CMA for uh, putting forward the proposals to growing forward to help support the infrastructure and the ongoing variety development at Ag Canada because they're critical partners in the launch of this new uh, species to the prairies. Creating and launching any new product starts with, uh, especially with biojet fuel, something that's quite foreign to us in agriculture, starts with the feedstock and bringing together of two industries. And in this case, it's the uh, connecting the capacity of agriculture to the demands of aviation to groups that have not normally talked and putting between them of, and proving to both sides that there's a robust value chain to be utilized along the way. If we're connecting agriculture to aviation, agriculture is all about scale. We know that we can produce, we have millions of acres at our disposal, we have billions of gallons of oil that we could potentially produce, and we have billions of tons of CO2 capture annually. Aviation needs scale to achieve global greenhouse gas reduction goals. There, uh, the industry-wide agreement is in place for carbon neutral growth by 2020 and 50% emissions reductions by 2050. And biofuels then is just part of that solution. If we look at a graphic presentation of the uh, challenge laid out in front of the aerospace industry then, we see represented in the graph here the uh, green sections which can be technologies that can be applied within the airline industry today, operations and infrastructures that can all be improved to take us from the point of no action up at the top here down to a point where we have to be for 2020 and then the point for 2015 if we're going to meet the mandates that have been agreed to by this industry. We know that in here, in this set blue section, is what additional technologies and biofuels can bring to the table to help meet this demand. And certainly Agrisoma believes that their technology and that the crop Ag Canada and Agrisoma has created can pay a big part in reaching these new goals. And I've just put in a couple of examples here. Uh, the Air National Airlines Council of Canada estimates that 150 million litres of biojet fuel is required to meet the 2020 mandate alone. This means that 2 million acres in Western Canada would allow the Canadian airline industry in Western Canada only, and it didn't say Western Canada on here, to be 100% biojet fuel. And you'll see why that's important a little bit later. The US military has also been quite vocal in their demand for biojet fuel. And if we look at their demand in North America only, that's 8.5 million acres and two times that on a world scale for their demand. So for Agrisoma, which is a company that's built its, uh, its footprint on uh, sustainable energy solutions founded in agriculture, Agrisoma was started in 2001 as a Canadian agricultural biotechnology company. It's focused on utilizing proprietary, what we call ETL, or engineered trait loci technology to enhance crop production. This ETL technology has been licensed out for application in foods and kept within Agrisoma for applications in industrial oils. The importance of ETL is it's part of that new technologies we saw on the graph. 
where the new technologies in the, uh, what was I think the blue section of uh, fuel and uh, technology, this kind of technology allows multiple genes to be, in per to be inserted into a plant to improve its productivity, its oil yield, its oil content, its overall agronomics, and that can help boost the position of the biofuel till it's a uh, pr profitable and economical uh, way to go for the airline industries. If we look, this slide mostly is here for one reason, and that's the statement, a drop in advanced crop based on Brassica carinata. Resonance is the, the name, the overall umbrella, rather than to keep referring back to Brassica carinata or Ethiopian mustard, which are the other two names you hear it called by. But the main drop in, what it means is that both agriculture and aviation need a product, a feedstock, that drops into their current scenario. So often new crops don't have that in place. So we know that brassicas in Western Canada, we're pretty familiar with how to grow them. Um, yes, there's a little bit of tweaking to do, but the same can be said for the airline industry. I mean, there is an industry that uh, you can't pull over to the side of the road and make adjustments. So you need a fuel that fits and drops into their current activities very well, whether it's refining, handling, processing, whatever. And that ha works with this particular mustard as well. So the oil fits well and the crop fits well in existing infrastructure. Carinata has a unique industrial oil profile in that most of our food oils are 18 carbon chains. Carinata oil is predominantly 22 carbon chain, which means there's just more carbon for the amount of oil that's been captured by the plant, making an excellent feedstock for advanced catalytic biojet and biodiesel processes. And we'll talk about that in more detail in a few minutes with the new study that was just released this week. And that Carinata seed is high oil content as it's been developed already. So it's, uh, we're really excited to see that it, the crop this year across Western Canada came in at 43.6%. We're just hoping it was somewhat better than 40% because that's the kind of values we need for this to be economical. And we've made it in year one. There were some initial reasons that A Canada developed the crop. Uh, partly because it's uh, uniquely suited to production in the semi-arid productions in West areas in Western Canada. Good biotic and abiotic stress resistance, and I know in my past I've certainly worked hard on trying to take some of the black leg genes out of this crop and move it to canola and other mustards. And certainly this crop has a lot of unique traits that are, uh, would be nice to have in all the brassica species, mustards or canolas and it has shatter resistance that's pretty darn interesting. We'll talk a lot more about it in a few minutes as well. Uh, we started out thinking that at the original plant density of five to six pounds uh, would be the right rate. It still seems to be about right, or eight plants per square foot, but uh, you'll see some of the experiences there weren't quite that, but still good. And we know that unlike a lot of new crops, it already comes into the market with a full suite of brassica species, herbicide and pest control options, and more to come. This slide is cluttered on purpose because we talk about the value chain and the infrastructure required to successfully launch a new crop. And you can just get a quick uh, eye candy type view of the, the multiple facets that come into play in our farm economy and the multiple steps that have to see value to participate and the same as it moves over into the fuel in the uh, aerospace sector. And the nice thing to report is that in this case, the value chain is established at commercial scale with good economics and metrics across the entire chain. And throughout the rest of this presentation, you'll quickly come to realize the partners that are coming, stepping up and are in place now to make this crop successful. This slide here, when it was put in a couple of weeks ago, was state-of-the-art information on the reduction of uh, uh, particulates in particular from test flights with a 50-50 blend, but since then we have this new report that just was handed to me as I was leaving the office, which is being presented at another conference in the U.S. right now, where the 100% uh, the jet fuel flights you heard of a month ago are now been in and the data analyzed, and there's three main points I want to refer to in here that are brand new information. The first point of the four that are so important that this study just told us is that there's almost no black carbon emissions detected in flight at the right altitudes using this new fuel. And so that's a huge improvement over the petroleum-based fuels that the industry's been using. There's a greater than 50% reduction in the CN number, which is the condensation nuclear number, or the aerosols that are emitted, which are other particulates. 
at the same time as an increase in fuel efficiencies, and the most fourth and most important point, there is absolutely no effect on engine performance. This fuel meets all the specs and all the performance criteria that can be measured. And to do this test, there was several flights taken with the NRC jets where they go up, they burn at the different rates, they burn different fuels and in different applications in flight, and then have a catch plane that catches the emissions and analyzes them. It's quite a sophisticated, neat capability we have in the country and has taken Canada to a world lead position in assessing new technologies such as the biojet fuels. And the great news is we passed with flying colors on all fronts. So now that's why we have demand in place and that's why there's excitement around the crop because the market is there ready to accept it and buy it. And that brings us to where we were this year in the commercial launch. We launched in a program in January. It was sold out immediately, oversubscribed a lot, but we only had seed for 6,700 acres and a uh, partner's in line to process that much fuel in this year. Um, we looked at the, the area in the map here, mostly southern Saskatchewan, southern Alberta, where it's, it's a bit of environmental challenges, especially for canola production where we use rotations that still often have some fallow in and we looked at the opportunities for this crop to replace some of the fallow or to be an after, crop, after fallow high value crop and certainly it's a new oil seed that in an area that hasn't had maybe very many oil seed options in particular. The first responses in the next few slides are just going to be responses and the little map at the top just showing the, uh, the regions in particular we're talking about at the moment. But the main response was this is bigger than what we expected. In other words, the crop, as you can see, grew very lush this year, even under challenging conditions, was very robust and showed us a lot more than we had seen in the small plots at Egg Canada in the past. Yes, it was impacted by some seed bed issues and a lot of challenges of heavy rains and very cool spring conditions and it didn't grow quickly at first. But once the heat hit, it took off and we were flooded with phone calls saying, well, can this thing grow? And I see some people down here smiling who grew it and know that. Um, at the same time, we knew it was drought tolerance and we had a region here in southern Saskatchewan around Frontier Climax that was extremely challenged this year. Very little moisture, not as bad as Montana and Havre and Huntley and Moccasin where we had plots as well. But we noticed and we're impressed by the fact that with less than two inches of rain after seeding, the crop here, I mean, looked quite good. Here's Napus that never really set seed at all in the end. And uh, the growth on the Carinata certainly likes the heat and can put up with a significant amount of drought. Here's in the Cinnaboy, Saskatchewan, where we also were severely challenged, but at the same time, it did produce a decent crop and did look quite interesting. And you can see by the plant in his hand, it still grew a significant plant under these conditions. Again, Climax Saskatchewan I mentioned, here's a, some pictures again with the one on your left being uh, on fallow where the stand was a bit poor and it was extremely challenged with no moisture all year and ran out very quickly. And on the right, the crop with a little higher inputs and on the fallow land in the same area same, with the same producer. We had a residence crop walk series where we invited producers <coughs> and interested parties to come on out and meet us at sites across the country to talk with producers, learn from each other, because the one thing we knew going into the year was there was a lots of learning opportunity and that no one had all the answers. And so in total, with that tour, uh, where people would join for a, a part of a day and then move on, and the official tours, we reached over 500 growers this year and the uh, interest was huge and we'll sp talk some more about what they're going to do because of that in the future. We also had some examples here in Alberta and lots in Saskatchewan of the ability to crop to compensate. So you see on the map again uh, the struggles we had in the Carmangay area with emergence. Didn't like the cool year, but we have four pictures. I wish we had a fifth, but it just takes you from where you couldn't really see the seedlings up at all and how bad it looked to not much better. And then finally the heat comes and it starts to come, starts to branch out and it can branch and branch and branch. And I wish we had the harvest picture to show you how well it was able to fill in but it impressed us a lot this year and, and it, certainly that was a comment from most of the growers. In fact, I visited six complaints where they thought it was worth plowing down or burning off that they, the crop should be scrapped. We decided not to in all cases and in the end every single one uh, of those producers felt it was worth having their 
field visited on the tour just because it had recovered and was so amazing to those who uh, could see it and to them in, in particular. And if you do give it good conditions, and I think Chris, uh, I think this is probably from your site at Indian Head, um, the crop certainly bushes out and bushes out. It's not like any of the other brassicas. It uh, has a unique habit, short racemes, but lots of them, and they keep coming and coming down in the canopy and filling in a lot. And at harvest, here was one of our seed growers, um, the Rennick brothers actually, they brought in 43 bushels under still some conditions they thought were a little challenging. Um, they were only set up to swath, which is not necessarily the best way to go, but it's the way they could. But it was quite impressive nonetheless uh, from a producer's point of view with what they went through this year and the challenges. Now overall, we put together now a few slides on the launch experience and then from a grower survey. Um, the seeding rates we recommended were between five and eight pounds and it went in around six. I don't think anybody achieved a plant stand near what we'd expect from a six. They were all less. Uh, seeding depth was the key and uh, half inch recommended but almost nobody got it in at that depth. It was deeper seeded due to heavy pounding rains in areas that don't normally experience those, crusting, uh, cool conditions, etc. So it had its challenges. Which did point out, though, the, the importance of pre-emergence herbicides and pre-seeds burn-offs to help preserve moisture that, when it does come unexpectedly, doesn't necessarily last a long time for us under these hotter conditions in these regions. But when the slow, uh, when the heat arrived, their slow growth turned into rapid advancement and excellent competition with weeds. The obvious concern is if we lose moisture early on with some of the weeds, so that burn-off and pre-emergence herbicides were deemed by all producers to be quite important. Planting dates were a bit uh, hard to come by this year because it was just get it in when you could, but uh, it seemed like late April and early May seeding dates were the best. We talked about the weed management. There was a lot of it just with a pre-emergence and uh, not a lot of in-crop use of herbicides. However, there was some sure to application for wild oats. Uh, mostly, like I say, broadleaf herbicides were not required or not used in 2012. There was a bit of a lack of communications, we'll say, because the minor use registrations were in process for muster and assure. And some of the observations on disease and insects, in fact, a lot of information was gained from this area. But starting uh, in Saskatchewan, certainly Astra Yellows was very predominant beyond levels we've ever seen before. And on this crop, it was quite a bit less than on the canolas. And the Berthy Armour Worm too, we only had one site of that, but it seemed to be significantly less on the Carinata than the Canola. Flea Beetles, Cabbage Root Maggot, Diamondback, Seed Pod Weevil, many of which the data we have is from this area, are all similar to Canola. Unfortunately, we can't report any great advantage over Canola. Uh, Sclerotinia was observed at Indian Head and a lot of other sites, but there in particular, where residents was less infected, but uh, less significantly affected by talking to Chris yesterday, we were saying, he was saying to me that this is probably due to just less spread, not so much less infection, but less plant damage because the, the fungus probably didn't grow as broadly and aggressively on the plant in Carinata. It was still there, but uh, had less overall percentage of plant damage. Harvest management, uh, when we went into this year, Ag Canada was the only place we had data from and a little bit from Chris the year before at Indian Head. Uh, but our experience to date was that seeds mature very quick. You can get down to five, six percent moisture and yet the stalks are still quite green and slow to dry down. That's good in some ways, bad in some ways, and we didn't have a large field scale experience. So, but we did tell growers that, you know, the seed certainly can be five, six percent moisture and your stem's still green, don't worry about it take it if you can. Well, we found out that that wasn't a good idea, <laughs> that actually we were better off if the growers let so the, to the stem turn gold as well because the harvest experience was much better. There was a lot of frustration when you took it at all green with the kind of biomass we had on most of the sites this year. The shattering resistance stood up very well even under high wind conditions at almost every site. Straight cutting is preferred just because of the cost savings and the fact that there was no dry down advantage between leaving it standing and in the swath dry down. And we did find that, you know, planting a carrot ended up being the last crop off. Somebody said a little bit like flax. Uh, yeah, definitely it's go away and forget it until you get most of the rest of your crop done and then come back. That's where you'll have the best success and not be frustrated with the harvest uh, with the green stem. Now crop observations and results, I'm going to call them. This is where we actually had two agronomists go out to all the uh, producers at least a couple times a year and contact them more than that. 
to check up on how the crop was growing. And the observations from these grower studies were that the impression was that Carinata certainly thrives in hotter temperatures than other brassicas. The branching habit of it can fill in and fill in and, and make up for poor stands to a large extent. There's a significantly less heat and pod blast than there is with Brassica napus. Producers, you know, we didn't have a lot of good direction we could give on fertility other than saying it's a lot like canola. But producers managed the basis what they expected in yield for the moisture they knew they had in their soil and their normal planting and production practices. And that the range used were from 35 pounds of M to 110 and pretty much you got what you put into it for investment in that situation, but on some hand, with the dry conditions some people produced, 35 to 60 probably was the right choice for them. The other thing was a key focus going forward needs to be on stand establishment because that still is going to set your top level for your yield, um, even though it can compensate a lot uh, and more than most crops, but vigorous growth, everyone observed it site after site and harving planning a must, I'm not sure what they meant by that other than uh, plan to leave it rather than get impatient because that just caused frustration. Now the actual results of yield, which is most important, was 10 bushels to high of 42 bushels on the commercial field. This area in particular was 20 to 42 with an average of 25 bushels. A little bit disappointing when you look at the crop, but then we could not take out all the hail damage sites because there were so many of them. So yes, it stood up to hail damage better than any other crop with less shattering, but we couldn't, uh, there were so many sites with it we couldn't take it out of our average. So that's partly led to the disappointing number, although it's still not too bad when you look at the biofuel produced per acre and where we have to go with that. We saw that 60% on the final survey of growers indicated they would like to grow it again and we hope to have them grow more of it because we won't have the same acreage restrictions of 120 acres as we had this year. 36% said they might grow it again and the undecided factor was largely due to the harvest challenges of taking it a little too early this year and that made too slow a combine speed to, um, for what they were used to in their operation. And the good news is all the crop was moved off farm in November and it's already been crushed and it's on the way to being into fuel and to fuel sales now. And obviously when you can move a crop that quickly and with this demand that we have at the moment, that certainly is a good story. Agronomic research, we didn't want to close without just mentioning that we know that there is some agronomic shortcomings in our research package and that a new production manual will be made every year for the next few years because we've got so much to learn and put into it and everybody's helping with that process. Unfortunately, we didn't get federal or provincial funds to go ahead with the plan we wanted to, which was individual studies on seeding rates, seeding dates, fertility rates, etc. Um, so we had to just go to a high, medium and low inputs, meaning 40, 60, 80 N and variable seed rates and dates all thrown together which is more a demo than a real trial, but we hope to get out this year with a proper trial at uh, six to 20 sites. I think we had this year about 18 on our plan, 18 sites lined up to do the studies if the funding hadn't, uh, if the funding had come through. And then from here on, it's Eric Johnson's presentation, really. Eric wrote for us the herbicide options as they sit today and what he's doing. Uh, he's been looking for a few years at the uh, products out there available to us today that could be used on this crop. Uh, he's got some new ones that I think will be in place for this time next year, but he's needing one more year of data for the, uh, the emergency registrations or the minor use registrations. Uh, he's moving on now looking at rates and timings, a little bit more fine tuning there this coming summer and now including tank mixes and again, uh, not a lot to report at this time because it's just the starting the tank mixes part in particular and some of the new products that he hopes to recommend a year from now need one more year of data before he can present it. But where we are in review, we now have pre-emergent uh, trifluralin registered for mustards. We have ethafluralin where you can't get a new registration, however, it works on all the other mustards and is tolerant and a lot of producers use that this year. Eric just mentions fall applications preferred. Uh, Pre-seed burn-off glyphosate or clean start is uh, pretty important in the mind of most growers this year. Uh, the minor use registration approvals that were underway last year are now in place for a uh, sure two for grassy weeds, mustard toss and go for broadleaf. Not that many people found that necessary, but if it is, the one caution he put down is the, uh, he's got a little bit of concern with merge as an adjuvant here, so or surfactant. So he's saying 
Um, because of that, he needs to do more work. He thinks there may be a problem there, so to stay away from that, and he's saying don't use tank mixes yet because he hasn't got the confidence yet that they're uh, good to go ahead with. He has had a lot of questions of pre-harvest glyphosate, doesn't see a problem with that, maybe some benefit in terms of evening out the crop or killing some green weeds. Um, wasn't a, a big question, but was certainly was a question throughout the year. Growth plans, last slide. Contracted acres would be significantly ex expanded this year, but we're going to save that announcement to the crop production show in Saskatoon in January. Um, Patterson was a great partner throughout this year uh, in launching this new crop. They will be the, the uh, residence uh, representative and uh, retail partner in the, across the Canada. So contact them, stay in touch with them. They certainly will know what contracts are out there. It will be a contract crop for the foreseeable future because of the requirement to meet demand and demand processing capacity with production and to uh, establish the value chain a little deeper than it has been and a little stronger. AgriSoma will be at the Crop Production Show and Ag Expo. Steve Fabijanski, our President and CEO, will be a guest speaker at Mustard Day at Crop Production Week. And uh, Swift Current and Venkata, the Saskatchewan Oilseed uh, Provincial Oilseed Rep, is setting up a day for producers to come in and learn about the crop because, like we said, the subscription in the spring was way beyond what we could contract and we needed um, um, to unfortunately turn a lot of people away, but there's a lot more interest since, so we'd like to have an education day for producers to learn more about the crop if they're going to join in the program for the following spring. And so, Residence Energy Feedstock has uh, become a reality. We are now growing fuel on the farm and burning it in the air with uh, a lot less emissions and a lot cleaner combustion products. And we have a whole multitude of partners that have been important in here, Patterson Grain, Cantera Seeds, Egg West Bio, uh, and National Research Council, obviously, for the very important fuel studies and in-flight studies, because in Canada we have that unique capability. Agri-Food Canada, Growing Forward, Sass Mustard, Prairie Gold, etc. Uh, a really impressive team that's worked together really seamlessly and helped make this a, a pretty good experience in year one. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Matt.